Jesus began to make it clear to his disciples that he was destined to go to Jerusalem and suffer grievously at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, to be put to death and to be raised up on the third day. Then, taking him aside, Peter started to remonstrate with him. Heaven preserve you, Lord, he said. This must not happen to you. But he turned and he said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an obstacle in my path, because the way you think is not God's way, but man's. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wants to be a follower of mine, let him renounce himself and take up his cross and follow me. For anyone who wants to save his life will lose it. But anyone who loses his life for my sake will find it. What then will a man gain if he wins the whole world and ruins his life? Or what is a man to offer in exchange for his life? For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And when he does, he will reward each one according to his behaviour. After I'd been in Zimbabwe for oh, about a year or so, I became quite ill. I knew it was more than just the usual upset stomach or too much sun. So after worrying for a while, I decided I'd have to see somebody. So I hitchhiked to the nearest mission hospital. And after a couple of hours there being poked and prodded and stabbed with needles of various sizes eventually a doctor came back and said yeah you're really quite ill thanks he wasn't very specific about what it was that was actually wrong but well it was obvious from his tone that it was serious and he suggested that I just pack up and go home I wasn't keen on doing that I was only supposed to be there for a couple of years anyway and I wanted to see it through. So we talked and he suggested a compromise that I'll leave the school and go and stay in the capital in Harare for a couple of months and recuperate there and have access to better medication and well, better food and hygiene too. It wasn't really practical. You know, I had nowhere to stay in Harare. And even if I did, I didn't want to miss a couple of months out of school. So eventually we settled on the idea that I would leave the country and come back home to Britain for a while until I was considerably better. So I sold a few things to get the airfare home and I flew to London, the only place you could fly to, and then hitchhiked all the way home back to Irvine. It was wonderful to see the faces on some of the drivers that picked me up. So where are you coming from? Zimbabwe. Hitching all the way. Kind of. It was great to be back catching up with family and friends, spending time with them. Mushrooms, eating mushrooms. Couldn't believe how much I'd missed eating mushrooms. <laughs> Going for walks in the rain. <sighs> Although I was home mainly to recover from being ill, I didn't waste my time either. At least I don't think so. I visited the local libraries and they were kind enough to donate hundreds and hundreds of books that had been withdrawn from circulation. In fact, they took me to their depot, a storage depot, and just invited me to go through all the books that were there and choose whatever I wanted. And then they made a few suggestions themselves of what might be useful. Visited a couple of the local schools that I'd been associated with, one I taught in and one that I went to. Master department particularly was helpful donating old textbooks that were no longer used and then the science departments 
donated surplus science equipment. Surplus. What school has got surplus equipment? Local Rotary Club invited me to give a talk and at the end of which donated the money we needed to buy timber and tools to build a library, at least to turn a large storage cupboard in the school into a library. And a local haulage firm, they offered to transport all of this material, all these books, out to the school for us in Kinarumba in Zimbabwe. They'd seen something in the local paper about what I was doing and wanted to do their bit to help. It was all very kind and generous and quite moving. And as the time drew near for me to go back to Zimbabwe, I was quite excited about what we'd be able to do. But I was also quite apprehensive. I had been ill and I didn't want to get that ill again. I discovered that, I was going to say a phobia of snakes, a fear of snakes, a phobia is an irrational fear. I think it's fairly rational to be frightened of snakes. I was terrified. And there were things that I really struggled with when I was out there, mainly mainly attitudes towards women and the way that they were treated. And I didn't want to continue fighting against that. And it's not something that I could just easily put up with. But I did want to go back. I'd started something and I hadn't finished it. And I was going out to something I knew this time. When I first went out, I had ideas of what it would be like, and most of them were wrong. This time, I knew what I was going to. And I knew, I knew I'd be able to do far more in the second year than ever I was able to do in the first. But I was still nervous. I was still struggling with it. And as the day drew near, friends and family started talking to me about it too trying to talk me out of it you've done great you've done a wonderful thing but you've had your adventure you don't need to go back and do it again you've done your bit you've helped them just send the books send the stuff they'll be just as grateful for them and for all their kindness and their concern they were just making it harder for me more difficult for me to do what I had freely chosen to do, what I really believed was the right thing for me to do. I didn't exactly say, get behind me, Satan, but the phrase did cross my mind. And I discovered a newfound sympathy for Jesus when he was trying to explain to his disciples where his road lay, what he knew was the right thing, what he had to do and Peter tries to talk him out of it. Peter was expressing concern, devotion, love, but he was also making it harder for Jesus to face an already difficult road. It can be so easy, can't it? So tempting to take the soft option, the easy road, to turn aside from a road full of challenges. But sometimes it's the hard road that we're actually called to take. It's the hard road that we have to walk. I suppose the question is quite simple. What hard road are you being asked to walk? What cross to carry? And what are the voices, the temptations that invite you to turn aside, to lay the cross down and to take the easy option? 